and welcome to the final event of our Winter Words author series. I'm Adrienne Brodeur, the Executive Director of Aspen Words. And for those of you who are new to us, we're a Colorado-based literary arts nonprofit and program of the Aspen Institute. Over the last six months of Winter Words events, we've heard from barrier-breaking food writers, heroic journalists, provocative novelists, and today from inspirational poets. Before I introduce our speakers, Carolyn Torrey has a few announcements. Thanks, Adrian, and hello, everyone. I wanna start by thanking all of the partners who've helped make this virtual Winter Words season possible. Thanks to our season presenting sponsors, Beth and Josh Mondry and Helen and Wally Obermeyer, our media partner, the Aspen Times, and our grantors of the city of Aspen and Les Dames d'Aspen. And finally, a very special thanks to our lead corporate sponsor, Book of the Month Club. Over the course of Winter Words, we've reached 2,000 live viewers in 49 states and several countries. We were blown away by the generosity of our participants. Many of you contributed donations on top of a ticket purchase. All of this helped make Winter Words possible. As we look ahead to the next season and fingers crossed, start hosting more in-person events, we hope to inc incorporate our new digital skills and positive takeaways from this strange time. We'd love to live stream so that our new audience members across the country can keep participating. And we want to continue to experiment with new formats like the virtual book clubs. And of course, offer our events free of charge for students and educators. Shout out to a group of Aspen High School students who are tuning in today. All of this takes additional resources, so we're asking for your continued support. This month, thanks to the Kattershaw Foundation, all gifts will be matched up to $75,000. So it's a great time to contribute and any amount helps. There's a link in the chat to our secure online donation form. Thank you for your support and for listening. And now let's get to the fun part. Adrian. Thanks, Carolyn. For our final Winter Words, we're thrilled to host former Poet Laureate Billy Collins during National Poetry Month, a 30-day celebration of poetry's power to shape culture, ignite thought, and distill truths. Billy Collins is that rare poet whose words bring joy and delight and leave readers deepened. For anyone who's ever felt intimidated by poetry, Whale Day and his other collections are the books for you, for they will change your idea of what a poem should look and sound like. Billy's work is both accessible and profound, illuminating the playful while revealing the hidden meaning. Billy Collins is the author of 12 collections of poetry, including The Rain in Portugal, Aimless Love, Horoscopes for the Dead, Ballistics, and most recently, Whale Day. A former distinguished professor at Lehman College of the City University of New York, Billy served as the United States Poet Laureate from 2001 to 2003, and as New York State Poet from 2004 to 2006. In 2016, he was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Letters. In the first segment of today's program, Billy will read some of his poems to us, and then in the second segment, he will be joined in conversation by Padraig Otuma. Padraig Otuma hosts the podcast Poetry Unbound with On Being Studios and in late 2019 was named Theologian in Residence for On Being, bringing art and theology into public and civic <coughs> life. His work centers around themes of language, power, conflict, and religion, and we've long been fans of how he illuminates verse on his podcast. We are so grateful to be ending the 2021 Winter Word series with the wisdom of these two gentle poets. Welcome Billy Collins and Padraig Otuma. Thanks very much, Adrian. And thank you, Adrian. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, Billy, as well, for the generosity of your time here and to everybody who's come along to this event. I'm not going to say much more other than to say to Billy, it has been many years that I've been hoping to hear you read, and I'm thrilled to be here today, and I'm looking forward to everything that you bring to us in this reading now. I'll rejoin right. you after about half an hour. Okay. Well, the moment has arrived, Patrick. Um, I'm very glad to be here. I wish I were actually there in Aspen, as many people around the world wish, but, um, but here at my desk, uh, I'm, I'm, 
I'm getting as close as I can. Um, I'm going to, today is Seamus Heaney's birthday. Many of us know this. And um, so I thought I'd begin by, I don't want to contaminate the unadulterated egotism of the experience here, <clears throat> but I'm going to read a little poem by Seamus Heaney and then a little poem um, by me uh, about Seamus in some way. And the poem uh, uh, by Seamus Heaney is called Postscript. Um, and it's about a certain, he'll tell you in the first few lines where you are and when you are. And I like poems like that. It's a place in Ireland. And he, um, he asks us to visit it. And the odd thing about the poem is that it's all seen uh, from the point of view of a car um, driving through this area. Postscript. And sometime, make the time to drive out west into County Clare along the flaggy shore in September or October when the wind and the light are working off each other so that the ocean on one side is wild with foam and glitter and inland among stones, the surface of a slate gray lake is lit by the earthed lightning of a flock of swans. Their feathers roughed and ruffling white on white, their fully grown headstrong looking heads tucked or cresting or busy underwater. Useless to think you'll park and capture it more thoroughly. You are neither here nor there a hurry through which known and strange things pass as big soft buffetings come at the car sideways and catch the heart off guard and blow it open. So odd that he's, uh, he's usually fully planted walking through a field, but here it's, it's a car and we used to stay quite near the flaggy shore there. And uh, so this is a little poem I wrote um, I didn't know this was, I didn't know Seamus was going to be in this poem. He found his way in and I wrote it <clears throat> on a walk or a speed walk, I call it, which just means fast, as fast as I can walk. Um, so, it's, so the title is uh, Speed Walk on August 31st, 2013. Nothing much to report this morning as if anyone were waiting to hear, putting the day on hold like just a few women jogging by, girls with their eyes lowered, and a few men, their awkward hellos. The squirrels don't really count because of their ubiquity, but there was the one brown rabbit frozen up ahead on the cinder path, immobile as a painting of a brown rabbit. So I stopped and tried to be as still as a pencil drawing of a man and maybe half a minute passed before he bounced himself into the woods. Was that you, Seamus, coming to pay me a little visit? Who else could it possibly be? I asked with confidence. Not Robert Penn Warren, surely. No, only you with your eye still bright. I always say, I think it would be impossible for me to write elegy for anyone, you know, at the top of the page and have any luck. But usually uh, I find the case uh, often writing about one thing, um, a deceased person uh, will appear. And uh, I always think there's no such thing as a distraction in poetry. And if, if the person occurs to me, um, then I, I let them into the poem. That was a poem uh, from a book called The Rain in Portugal, which has nothing to do with Portugal or rain, but it's actually, speaking of Seamus, it's actually a trigger warning that uh, to warn you that I'm not much of an end rhymer like the rain in Spain would be. So here's a, uh, here's a joke, <laughs> here's, here's a joke and a poem. It's a poem called 1960. In the old joke, the marriage counselor tells the people tells the couple who never talks anymore to go to a jazz club because at a jazz club, everyone talks during the bass solo. But of course, no one starts talking just because of a bass solo or any other solo for that matter. The quieter bass solo just reveals the people in the club who have been talking all along. 
the same ones you can hear on some well-known recordings. Bill Evans, for example, who is opening a new door into the piano while some guy chats up his date at one of the little tables in the back. I have listened to that album so many times, I can anticipate the moment of his drunken laugh as if it were a strange note in the tune. And so, anonymous man, you have become part of my listening, your romance, a romance lost in the past, and a reminder somehow that each member of that trio has died since then, and maybe so have you, and sadly, maybe she. And this is a poem a little further on here, which is called, which is about a condition I've um, been in since birth and it's called Only Child. I never wished for a sibling, boy or girl. Center of the universe, I had the back of my parents' car all to myself. I could look out one window, then slide over to the other window without any quibbling over territorial rights. And whenever I played a game on the floor of my bedroom, it was always my turn. Not until my parents entered their 90s did I long for a sister, a nurse I named Mary, who worked in a hospital five minutes away from their house and who would drop everything, even a thermometer whenever I called. Be there in a chiff and on my way were two of her favorite expressions and mine. And now that the parents are dead, I wish I could meet Mary for coffee every now and then at that Italian place with the blue awning where we would sit and reminisce even on rainy days. I would gaze into her green eyes and see my parents, my mother looking out of Mary's right eye and my father staring out of her left, which would remind me of what an odd duck I was as a child, a little prince and a loner who would break off from his gang of friends on a Saturday and find a hedge to hide behind. And I would tell Mary all about that too and never embarrass her by asking about her non-existence. And maybe we would have another espresso and a pastry and I would always pay the bill and walk her home. Now, I do want to turn to this uh, most recent book called Whale Day <clears throat> with a kind of apocalyptic whale flying through the sky on his way, God knows where. And um, I'm going to start by uh, a little poem in the front here with an odd title. Um, the poem is called, called Walking My 75-Year-Old Dog. She's painfully slow, so I often have to stop and wait while she examines some roadside weeds as if she were reading the biography of a famous dog. And she's not a pretty sight anymore, dragging one of her hind legs, her coat too matted to brush or comb, and a snout white as a marshmallow. We usually walk down a disused road that runs along the edge of a lake whose surface trembles in a high wind and is slow to ice over as the months grow cold. We don't walk very far before she sits down on her worn haunches and looks up at me with her roomy eyes. Then it's time to carry her back to the car. Just thinking about the honesty in her eyes, I realize I should tell you, she's not really 75, she's 14. I guess I was trying to appeal to your sense of the bizarre, the curiosities of the sideshow. I mean, who really cares about another person's dog? Everything else I've said is true, except the part about her being 14. I mean, she's old but not that old. And it's not polite to divulge the true age of a lady. <clears throat> I 
And here's a poem called Downpour. <clears throat> the first line uh, would indicate that it's going to be a very sexy poem, but I'm afraid it's not. Last night we ended up on the couch, trying to remember all of the friends who had died so far. And this morning I wrote them down in alphabetical order on the flip side of a shopping list you had left on the kitchen table. So many of them had been swept away as if by a hand from the sky. It was good to recall them, I was thinking, under the cold lights of a supermarket as I guided a cart with a wobbly wheel up and down the long strident aisles. I was on the lookout for blueberries, English muffins, linguine, heavy cream, light bulbs, apples, Canadian bacon, and whatever else was on the list, which I managed to keep grocery side up until I had passed out through the electric doors where I stopped to realize as I turned the list over that I had forgotten Terry O'Shea as well as the bananas and the bread. It was pouring by then, spilling as they say in Ireland, people splashing across the lot to their cars. And that is when I set out walking slowly and precisely, a soaking wet man bearing bags of groceries, walking as if in a procession honoring the dead. I felt I owed this to Terry, who was such a strong painter for almost forgetting him, and to all the others who had formed a circle around him on the screen in my head. I was walking more slowly now in the presence of the compassion the dead were extending to a comrade. Plus, I was in no hurry to return to the kitchen where I would have to tell you all about Terry and the bananas and the bread. And um, this is a poem called Me First. And it's, uh, it's based on, I think, something that people think about with some regularity. But I think we were always a little ashamed that we find ourselves thinking of it. And the question we're thinking of is who goes first? Um, you can think about this about your parents, about even children, or if you have, I don't know, if you have two cats, who's going to go first? It's not something we like to dwell on. But there is an expression I found out after I'd written this poem in Arabic, which I'll mispronounce, but it's something like your borni, which is a formal declara declaration. Literally it means uh, you bury me. It's a declaration of the desire to precede, to predecease, as we say today, the other one. <clears throat> me first. We often fly in the sky together and we're always okay. There's our luggage now waiting for us on the carousel. And we drive lots of places in all manner of hectic traffic. Yet here we are pulling in the driveway again. So many opportunities to die together, but no meteor has hit our house. No tornado has lifted us into its funnel. The odds say then that one of us will go before the other like heading off into a heavy snowstorm, leaving the other one behind to stand in the kitchen or lie on the bed under the fan. So why not let me, the older one, go first? I don't want to see you everywhere as I wait for the snow to stop before setting out with a crooked stick calling your name. So I had a, a wonderful guy who was in uh, Spain. He's translating some of my poems into Spanish. And uh, he wanted to know about crooked stick. <laughs> and uh, he came across a word in Spanish, queado, I think it was, which is a crook, like a shepherd's crook. But that's the last thing I want that guy to be carrying at the end, like little Bo Peep. So um, that's the fun of working with a translator. You get into all these, you know, what's a, cro what's a crook? In fact, in English, crook means so many things <clears throat> as uh, we Nixon fans know. So um, I want to read um, uh, two poems about dogs. 
This is from a book called um, Aimless Love. And in both poems, the, the, the dogs are uh, the control, the dialogue or the monologue. Here the dog is, <clears throat> I imagine the dog just thinking to itself, maybe half asleep. And it's a short poem, it's called A Dog on His Master. As young as I look, I am growing older, faster than he. Seven to one is the ratio they tend to say. Whatever the number, I will pass him one day and take the lead the way I do on our walks in the woods. And if this ever manages to cross his mind, it would be the sweetest shadow I have ever cast on snow or grass. And that's the kind of sensitive dog we all are hoping for. But we don't always get. Now here's a dog that's on the other end of the, uh, of the emotional spectrum. <clears throat> and this is um, a poem called The Revenant, which is a big Latinate name for a ghost. <clears throat> the Revenant. I am the dog you put to sleep as you like to call the needle of oblivion, come back to tell you this simple thing, I never liked you. When I licked your face, I thought of biting off your nose. When I watched you toweling yourself dry, I wanted to leap and unman you with a snap. I resented the way you moved your lack of animal grace, the way you would sit in a chair to eat a napkin on your lap, a knife in your hand. I would have run away, but I was too weak. A trick you taught me while I was learning to sit and heal and greatest of insults, shake hands without a hand. I admit the sight of the leash would excite me, but only because it meant I was about to smell things you had never touched. You do not want to believe this, but I have no reason to lie. I hated the car, the rubber toys, disliked your friends and worse, your relatives. The jingling of my tags drove me mad. You always scratched me in the wrong place. All I ever wanted from you was fresh water and food in my metal bowls. While you slept, I watched you breathe as the moon rose in the sky. It took all of my strength not to raise my head and howl. Now I am free of the collar, free of the yellow raincoat, monogram sweater, the absurdity of your lawn. And that is all you need to know about this place, except what you already supposed and are glad it did not happen sooner that everyone here can read and write, the dogs in poetry, the cats and all the others in prose. And now for a less exciting <laughs> uh, bit here. This is just a, uh, it's called In the Evening and it re really was attended and it, and it is simply a sketch of um, uh, that, that certain time of day, the evening. So a crepuscular, crepuscular poem. In the evening, the heads of roses begin to droop. The bee who has been hauling her gold all day finds a hexagon in which to rest. In the sky, traces of clouds, the last few darting birds, watercolors on the horizon. The white cat sits facing a wall. The horse in the field is asleep on its feet. I light a candle on the wood table. I take another sip of wine. I pick up an onion and a knife. And the past and the future? Nothing but an only child wearing two different masks. <clears throat> Can't get rid of the only child there. And um, this is, a, well, these are all from this poem, this book, Aimless Love, which is a new and selected poem. So there are a lot of poems in there. 
to read. And this is a poem called The Trouble with Poetry. And whenever I read it, I always like to say that it's not to worry, it's not a terribly lo long poem uh, because it's not about uh, all of the troubles of poetry. It's just about uh, one of the troubles with poetry. The Trouble with Poetry. The trouble with poetry I realized as I walked along a beach one night, cold Florida sand under my bare feet, a show of stars in the sky. The trouble with poetry is that it encourages the writing of more poetry, more guppies crowding the fish tank, more baby rabbits hopping out of their mothers into the dewy grass. And how will it ever end unless the day finally arrives when we have compared everything in the world to everything else in the world and there is nothing left to do then but quietly close our notebooks and sit with our hands folded on our desks. Poetry fills me with joy and I rise like a feather in the wind. Poetry fills me with sorrow and I sink like a chain flung from a bridge. But mostly, poetry fills me with the urge to write poetry, to sit in the dark and wait for a little flame to appear at the tip of my pencil. And along with that, the longing to steal, to break into the poems of others with a flashlight and a ski mask. And what an unmerry band of thieves we are, cut purses, common shoplifters, I thought to myself as a cold wave swirled around my feet and the lighthouse moved its megaphone over the sea, which is an image I stole directly from Lawrence Ferlinghetti, to be perfectly honest for a moment, the bicycling poet of San Francisco, whose little amusement park of a book I carried in a side pocket of my uniform up and down the treacherous halls of high school. So anyway, uh, you get to a point where um, you, uh, you're getting near to the end of the poem. You can kind of sense that it's not going to be too much longer. And um, if you're lucky, as I was in that poem, someone will ride um, on a bicycle in this case to your rescue. Something will pop up that has nothing to do with the initiating spirit of the poem, but a kind of jack-in-the-box surprise visitor and uh, who is recognized, in my personal experience anyway, as, yeah, that's the ending. We're not, we're just sting, sticking with you and we're not going any farther. Um, and uh, we're getting close to the time, so I'll just read um, maybe one or two more here. Here's a poem which is um, um, mentions Yeats. Um, uh, there was a poem we were looking at yesterday. I was looking at um, by gosh, Philip Booth, I think, and it was about uh, actually counting crows. Well, be well before the band came along, but he would, saw nine crows and he was kind of telling you what each one was doing. And um, we know that. Um, uh, Yeats was a swan counter from being at Cool Park. And uh, before he had a chance to, I think he counted 59. <clears throat> and then they all, they took off. He didn't have a chance. Didn't, didn't do the, didn't complete the census. And I used to walk around this lake that had swans uh, sometimes. And I would, of course, I mean, I'd walk in the dog and the, the dog was just sniffing around. And I was, I'd, nothing to do but count swans but i always think because swans are supposed to mate for life or at least they're well let's just say they're relatively monogamous relative to us for example um that if i counted an even number of swans um you know they i thought well, they're all you know happ happily married this is me in the morning and if there's an odd number i thought well, well who's the who's the weird bachelor out there you know who's the on a company, or maybe who's the widow, who knows? And then I'd be along, for too long I'd be home. Anyway, we get along to that, but around to that, but for, for at first we have a little uh, examination of, of the word genius. And that's the name of the poem, genius. 
genius was what they called you in high school if you tripped on a shoelace in the hall and all your books went flying or if you walked into it or if you walked into an open locker door you would be known as einstein who imagined riding a streetcar into infinity later genius became someone who could take a sliver of chalk and squire pie a hundred places out beyond the decimal point, or a man painting on his back on a scaffold, or drawing a water wheel in a margin, or spinning out a little night music. But earlier this week on a wooded path, I thought the swans afloat on the reservoir were the true geniuses, the ones who had figured out how to fly, how to be both beautiful and brutal and how to mate for life. 24 geniuses in all, for I numbered them as Yeats had done, deployed upon the calm crystalline surface. 48, if we count their white reflections, or an even 50, if you wanna throw in me and the dog running up ahead, who were at least smart enough to be out there that morning, she sniffing the ground, me with my head up in the bright morning air. So I think that's uh, that's enough out of me for a minute. <laughs> anyway, so I'll uh, I'll turn things over to uh, Patrick. Billy, thank you so very much for um, reading such a lovely selection of your poems from so many different areas uh, across your work. You're very welcome. I'd, I'd be curious to hear from you. Um, just the way you talk about walking and seeing what you see, you know, just even that last poem there while you're out looking at the swans and you and your dog and not only looking at the swans, but um, looking at their reflections and then thinking about you and your dog as two other animals in conversation, really, with what you're seeing. What what is the function of meandering in your work? Because often I, I feel like I'm being taken on a walk with you when I read your work. Well, that's a good thing. I kind of intend the reader to, first of all, be a, a companion. And I try to write the poems in one piece, you know, one sitting, even if it's a, it could be a long sitting in some cases, and get to the end in one sitting. And I have a feeling if I do that, uh, and I manage to do that most of the time, the reader, it'll, it'll be a kind of an organic experience for me, and it will, that will somehow um, translate into the reader's experience who will have a sense that this is a kind of ongoing thing. It's a thought process rather than an act of literature in which different things are kind of stapled together. But um, I don't know, walking, you'd say a lot about walking. There's the tradition of the flaneur, there's the Latin expression, silvatur ambulandi, which means it is solved by walking. You walk out to a certain I have a friend and every summer we take a walk on the beach. It goes, we walk for about, I don't know, quarter of a mile, half a mile. Mm -hmm. And we have an agreement that um, uh, on the way out, we talk about her, nothing but her. I have to shut up. Then on the <laughs> way back, we talk nothing about me. So, um, but um, I don't know. It's another thing about walking and composing. Wordsworth was the great walker, a couple of hundred thousand miles. And he had a little garden in which to walk after he couldn't walk, you know, outside and in, uh, in the in nature. But um, I don't poetry for me is not something that's done at the desk. You know, I rarely sit down and say I'm going to commit an act of literature before noon or something like that. I usually it'll come something comes to me. It could be in an airport or driving, but but very often walking. And uh, like that poem about that ended up being about Seamus was this walk that I take yeah. four or five times a week around this uh, this lake that's just down the, the street here. So I don't know. And, um, yeah. And when you walk, I mean, you see all kinds of different things, even if you know the walk very well. You know, you see a new kind of light on the tree or something different that you wouldn't have expected or some growth that's happened, you know, even in the middle of winter. And do you find the same in your poems that when you're sitting down to write about something that something unexpected comes to you as you're going through a walk as you're composing the poem? Well, that's very well put. And, and, um, and you, I mean, you're right in the first place that no two walks are the same. 
And there's always, uh, here in Florida, there are some very uh, peculiar, to me, who brought up in New York, peculiar looking birds that, uh, that can fly across your face and startle you. Um, but that is a, a great way to put um, composition, I think, Patrick, that it is a, a verbal or an imaginative walk. And um, one is always looking for the odd bird, you know, the, a new way to take the poem. And clearly, uh, you know, as poets, we, we would never have said many of the things we say had we not started writing the poem. So what comes, what spills out of the beginning of the poem, uh, if you're lucky and you're paying attention, um, I mean, you can't write poetry without writing it. And once you're writing it, um, you, you don't know it's going to come off. You mean you're, you're partly in charge. You know, you have one hand on the steering wheel and then at some point you, you kind of, it's a, it's a self-driving car. <laughs> I'm thinking Sorry. about that. I'm thinking about that dog that looked back on the walker and thinking what a beautiful shadow my walker and my owner is um, casting on the snow. It's almost like you're saying a similar thing with the poem, that the poem is looking back at the one who's leading it, but also recognizing that it's in charge. Yeah, it's a very uh, interesting uh, relationship, uh, poet to poem as you go especially in the, in the throes uh, of composition. And I, I think you, you really have to listen to the poem um, to see where a poem will take on. I mean, playwrights sometimes say, well, once I got the characters invented, you know, they just had their own will. And I kind of just wrote down that what they would say. That sounds a little too easy to believe. Mm -hmm. But um, and um, I don't have many characters in my poem. I want to be alone with the reader, basically. But I do have the poem itself, which has the poem can develop a kind of consciousness and even a willfulness that it, the poem wants to kind of drift off or lean toward or it becomes interested in some aspect of itself and, for, and kind of forgets the subject. <laughs> and all, all, all of that can be accomplished if you just have a very light touch on the poem and you allow it some... Um, you allow, you allow it to be a conspirator or, a, or an accomplice as the poem is being fashioned. I mean, you have spent an entire career and an entire life really in conversation with poetry. It was a desire of yours from being a, a teenager, am I right, to have to be a poet and you did a PhD. And I think I heard you say you did a PhD in inaccessible poetry and then wrote inaccessible poetry into your 30s. Well, I, I did a PhD in Wordsworth and Coleridge, but I was um, I was smitten by uh, inaccessible poetry. I thought that was the challenge. I, I took a, a very memorable seminar in graduate school, <clears throat> which was <clears throat> excuse me, a concentration on two poets only, Hart Crane and Wallace Stevens, very difficult poets. And incidentally, it was taught by a guy named Joseph Riddle. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, to be a graduate student, I mean, you have to have a taste for difficulty and complexity and exegesis and all the, and, and all that stuff. But um, I kind of got uh, away from that uh, when I started reading simpler poets, um, like, I mean, simple, at least in statement, like Philip Larkin, uh, like, <clears throat> like the New York School of like Kenneth Koch and Ron Patchett and uh, William Matthews and uh, so many poets, uh, Ron Kirchhey, um, mm -hmm. who were very plain spoken and yet very uh, interesting and mysterious and even profound things can happen. But it wasn't because the syntax was all twisted out of shape. The sentences just rolled along in a fairly, fairly clear way, but the imagination, the sense of the head and the heart working against or together, all that drama was very rich. Yeah. There's a hospitality in your poetry, in the titling of them and in the opening of them. There's usually a, a clarity about where one is when we're on a reading a poem of yours, um, even though they often take unexpected twists halfway through or even toward the end. The openings of them and the titling of them is often done as an invitation in rather than as a riddle. Well, I, I, 
you have to keep talking. I love this. I mean, you're, <laughs> you're just I mean, hospitality is a word I, I, I love to use a hospitable opening. And it is the opening that's hospitable. Well, I, I get less hospitable as, as I've the noticed. Yeah. <laughs> oh. But, um, but I want, I want to get the reader on board and I want, I want the title to be invitational. I want the first few lines to be very orienting. That poem by uh, Seamus Postscript, yeah. he says it's in uh, County Clare. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, um, it's October or September, it's fall. It's yeah. flaggy shore, it gets more specific. He, he tells you exactly where you are. My sense of that is that if you don't get the reader oriented in the beginning, you can't get the reader disoriented at the end. And I'm trying, <laughs> I want to. I would. I like to leave reader, readers in a state of mild disorientation at the end, so they lose that confident sense of well, we are here, and it's fall. Like a haiku does that, right? You always know the season and the, the situation. You even know how drunk the poet is. You know, in many <laughs> cases. Um, but then I. It, I hope it leads, and I get more complex, and the poem leads to. Uh, something a little yeah. wackier. Oh, my favorite, uh, it's an old one for me, but it, my favorite metaphor is that we begin in Kansas and end up in Oz. Yeah. In a familiar domestic place and end up, who knows. Mm -hmm. um, in this new collection, Whale Day, one of the poems that I couldn't get, I couldn't stop thinking of was the one about the mice and where you call them anonymous companions towards the end. And you finish up with this, I'll quote it, um, you're describing yourself, an elderly child with a tummy full of oatmeal and a mouse on my shoulder, standing on its hind legs, whispering in my ear. And I kept on thinking, what's that <laughs> mouse saying? <laughs> now, what's like, a, you know, what the, how did we get here? You know? Yeah, yeah, uh, totally. But I forget the beginning of the poem, but it's, uh, I'm sure it's more, no mouse, I wouldn't start a poem with a mouse whispering in my ear. No, I, yeah. I have to earn that or get to that. Yeah. Um, John Updike wrote that your poems are more serious than they seem. And I, the very first collection of yours I bought in 2000, that I bought was in 2002. It was my first time visiting New York City and I made my way to Strand Bookstore. And I found that um, anthology of yours, um, Sailing Alone Around the Room, and that was one of the quotes on the back of it, that your poems are more serious than they seem. And I find that to be so true in so many of your poems, because like in this one, as well as in some of the ones you just read that weren't from this new book, you know, you're talking about identity and aging mm. and death and art and really serious questions about meaninglessness and meaningfulness and what to do in the face of death. Well, I'll finish my pasta. You know, you're holding these things lightly while at the same time thinking, well, maybe a revolution in the face of all this not knowing about what life is, is to just enjoy a glass of wine, is to enjoy pasta. Is that a deliberate thing for you? Is that your, is that uh, a, a contribution to you in terms of saying this is a serious um, posture to take in the face of all the not knowing of the world? Well, I think that's an attempt to be cool. <laughs> I mean, something that, that you know, some of us don't really recover from since high school. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Poets take themselves so seriously. Yeah. And I'm always, I'm always trying to put on a kind of nonchalance where I'm not taking anything that seriously, except pasta, you know, except, except the dog, except walking the dog, except what I happen to be doing. And these larger obsessions, issues, a human, uh, what makes us human, uh, love, separation, death, grief, uh, natural beauty. Uh, I mean, all of that is kind of swimming around and kind of trying to get into the poem and it comes in through the side window or something. But there's that underpinning of themes that have, you know, these, these ancient themes. Yeah. Uh, but the persona who is not quite me, but <clears throat> pretty much, pretty much like me. He's, he's a lot yeah. like me. He's like a like a twin brother who went off in some other direction and never had to work. Yeah. <laughs> Just takes walks with the dog. Probably, and well, it's only does. I wish I were this 
for persona. <laughs> Do you ever see taking yeah. out the garbage or any of that? Going or going to an office? No, no, never. Yeah, he never seems tired. Yeah, he's, a, he's, al he's, he's always smoking his last hungry. cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> he's never hungry, or he's hungry sometimes, but he, yeah, you no, know, he never goes to sleep on you. <laughs> um, it's always wakeful. I, in preparing to read for you, I started to read to, to in preparing to meet you and talk about this book. I started to read around about comedy and I came across a great book called Comedy, A Very Short Introduction, which is my kind of book. And it quotes Freud and says that Freud said that we scarcely ever know what we're laughing at in a joke, which I think is a fascinating thing that we don't really know what humor is until we recognize it. And it's afterwards we can think what was funny about that, what was the technique, but that there's always something subtle happening within the context of a joke or within the context of humor or comedy. Right. Are you amused by your own poems or do you know the turns and the twists um, when it comes to the question of co the comedy or the humor or the lightheartedness that you're doing in your oh, work? Yeah. I, 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 yeah, yeah, I mean, well, I, when I hear a joke, I think I know what I'm laughing at. Okay. <clears throat> I think the difference with Freud. In fact, in fact, Freud's most boring book is the book called Jokes and I think it's Jokes and the Unconscious. Yeah, that's the way that quote uh, is there, from that. Yeah. He, has, he has illustrates this with these long, you know, German jokes, <laughs> uh, which are not funny, and especially in translation. But um, I know, I know of a poem. I can feel a poem getting funny. And at the end of a poem, if I look back at it, I, <clears throat> I, uh, I, I don't know what I do. I chortle or something. I mean, I recognize that <clears throat> that it made a, a, a successfully humorous turn, and it's not a, drawing attention to itself as a all funny poem all the time. Mm -hmm. But um, the big, I mean, one of the big, uh, going back to Wallace Stevens and and. Hard crane, but just for a moment, um, one of the big changes in how I got out from under the big rock of modern complexity and poetry or modern difficulty was um, reading poems that had a sense of humor and realizing that uh, you, you didn't have to be <clears throat> a light verse poet to be, uh, uh, if you were funny, you could be as a, an anthology is called seriously funny yeah and uh so that was a big uh very liberating if you'll pardon the word yeah <clears throat> for me yeah. and my poetry because i was i was funny my father was hilarious most of my friends when I, in high school and college and beyond uh were picked usually because they were funny in some way yeah, that, that short book on comedy says that it's um, possible to be serious about comedy without being solemn. And I think your right. work right. often encapsulates that. One more thing about that, and that is that, um, you know, anybody can pretend to be serious. Hmm. In fact, I would say, uh, Padraig, we are, you and I are pretending to be serious, maybe more serious now than usual. But you can't pretend to be funny. You can't you could put on seriousness. All you have to do is get a clipboard and go like this, you know, oh, really, that's uh, fascinating. Um, but you can't pretend to be funny. So there's something um, authentic about being funny. And its authenticity um, is, is also proven by the fact that you can make people laugh. Now, laughter is a um, involuntary action, if it's an honest laugh, like sneezing. I mean, you're creating you're, giving, you're making people have an involuntary reaction, which is, that's why people get addicted to stand-up comedy, because you keep making them crack up. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. I, I'd like to talk to you um, about, about death and the, the occupation that you have in this latest book, and that lots of people have an occupation that people have about um, thinking about death while we're alive. And like you read the poem, um, Me First, and referred to that desire to predecease that from the, that kind of phrase in Arabic. Um, and even in that imagination of the trio of, of jazz musicians, um, you're imagining to say, well, they're probably dead. And in one of the poems in this book, your, this new book, Well Day, you're um, looking at a robin, thinking that that robin might predecease you, and maybe even the worm. Again, this turn of humor, you know, if the worm is wily enough, maybe, maybe um, 
The worm will outlive me. Yeah. The worm will outlive you, yeah. Right. Uh, maybe even the robin too. What do you think is um, is that work in the work about the speculation about death and the trying to remember of people's names on the back of shop? Well, it could be like whistling past the graveyard a little bit of that, yeah. but but it's I mean it's not only the oldest theme and probably the oldest theme in in poetry. Um, I think the carpe diem might be the you know the the label for maybe the oldest theme in in poetry. And that's mm -hmm. simply a poem that looks at life through the lens of death and, and it's what makes it more um, exciting. I mean, I, I mentioned um, I'm, I, the thrill of mortality. They didn't want me to put that in the book, but I, but I, in the copy of the book, but, um, but I got it in there. Yeah. Uh, I talk, you know, the Collins talks about the, uh, the beauties of life and the thrill of mortality. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, Kafka, when asked, uh, what is the meaning of life? I think it was Kafka. He said, the meaning of, of life is that it ends. Mm. And that <laughs> couldn't be put more bluntly. So, and I think poetry is um, kind of in a way, uh, a reminder to a lot of people that we, we are uh, limited in our days. And it's a kind of maybe in, a, in, in the way of, to his coy mistress, it's sort of a call to action, not necessarily sexual action, but just more engagement, like even as the existentialists used to say, engage, you know, you're engaged with life, you're plugged in, you're not, you're not sleep, sleep walking through. And as Mary Oliver said, what are you going to do with this one precious life? I think yeah. that's the line. And uh, yeah, that's, one wild and precious life. Yeah. One wild and precious life. Thanks. And yeah. that's, um, that's a that's a really ringing question, and, and the the kind of call to engage that you're talking about is a call to, as I mentioned earlier on, enjoy the pasta or look at the swans. That there is a a presence that's happening. Right. The whole way throughout your book, I thought of something that happened to me last year. Uh, a person who I barely knew, I'd met her five or six times at various retreats or conferences or talks, and. Um, she contacted me to say she was going to die um, soon. And she did die four or five nights after we spoke. And she said she wanted to say some words, some very kind words. And then she said, what have you done today? And I told her and she said, tell me more. What did you see? And she, you know, she was really ill and she couldn't look out a window and she wanted to see and yeah. that there was a way within which the ordinariness. And I said, and God, I had so many damned emails to answer. And she said, tell me about them. <laughs> and, you know, I would never have thought that. Yeah, I would never have thought that emails or, yeah. you know, looking out to the changing season would be the kind of amongst the last things I'd say to her. But it's those ordinary things. And I thought of her so often reading this book because in the midst of, uh, a kind of a lively and sometimes humorous look at death. You're also turning attention not to go out and seize the day, but go out and walk the dog or go out and look yeah, at the light. Yeah. And that's the way of doing it. Yeah, I mean, think of it, think of everything you're going to miss. I mean, if you're yeah, so you you would miss everything. Um, mm -hmm. But going to the post office, uh, you know, raking leaves. Yeah, I mean, this is like uh, uh, Larkin's Obad, you know, it's like nothing, nothing. So, but uh, yeah, it's the, it's, it is the little things. And I think that's, poetry is what, you know, it uses the language of the world, the speaking language of things, Emerson calls it, that, that the, the tree stump or whatever, they're all talking, you know, they'll have a, um, not so much a story, but they're saying something. Yeah. And um and that's um, getting getting into that world is, is where and that's what po poetry is using that language. It's not using political language or abstract language. It's using um, teacup and uh, and uh, picture frame and mm. cigarette, just everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're going to, in a while, move towards um, finishing and have an opportunity to hear you finish us out with a final poem. But um, I heard you speak about, um, you were speaking about your mother and that she would regularly quote Shakespeare. 
And you were saying that she had been educated in a time and others too, yourself as well, when people memorized poetry. And you made a kind of an aside to say um, that unfortunately doesn't happen now. What are your thoughts about the memorization of poetry, um, not just by poets, but in schools yeah. and the kind of function? I mean, this new book opens up with a poem about the function of poetry. And so there is a, while you're not saying that it is um, necessary, you are saying that yeah. it is perhaps vital. It's thought to be very old fashioned, I think. Um, my mother was born in 1901 in a rural uh, part of Ontario, Canada, <clears throat> like a little red schoolhouse kind of thing, I guess. Um, but I think memorization then was, that's the way you taught poetry. You, know, you didn't analyze it, um, you internalized it. You had, you had children memorize it. And that's where all of her poems came from. They were installed in her as a school child, school girl, and as an, uh, she didn't memorize poems as an adult, willfully. They were just uh, installed there. I used to have my, I have my students to memorize a poem, just a little poem, sonnet or an Emily Dickinson poem. And one of the most, I'll just make this quick, but one of the most gratifying moments I had as a professor was being on a, a subway in New York and the guy across the aisle was look, kept looking at me and you're not supposed to look at anybody on the subway, but, <laughs> but and you're not supposed to come over and sit next to somebody, but he did. And he, I, he told me that he was a student of mine. I had forgotten, but it was some time ago because he'd become a doctor. He was an oncologist even. And so it's a long way from English 101 or whatever it was. And he said, you made us memorize a poem and I'd like to recite it for you. So it. over the roar of the subway, he recited, he, in my ear, he's, he said this little Emily Dickinson poem, and it just about brought tears to my eyes that he carried this thing with him. And uh, when, you, when you tell students you're gonna memorize, they all groan, no, we don't want, but once they memorize the poem, they feel so cool about it. They can't wait to get into your office and say it for you, you know, with their eyes closed. Like. Yeah, it becomes part of you. All this last year, you know, with all the COVID recommendations of washing your hands for 20 seconds, I've been, um, like the, the, some of the announcements here were to sing happy birthday to yourself twice, which I just thought would drive me mad <laughs> to do that, you know, to, to time 20 seconds. Yeah. So I started to recite um, Yeats's To a Child Dancing in the Wind, which I'd learned at the age of 11. And it was, it's been a lovely thing to recite that poem so many times every single day for the last year. Well, you know, a Hail Mary and a Holy Mary is about 20 seconds also. <laughs> Yeah. I should have thought of that. <laughs> plus, there could, plus, there could be an extra benefit there. You never. That's consider. true. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was. Yeah. I was stuck in a uh, an MRI once, and I didn't know. I'd never been in one, and never heard of. I didn't know. I didn't know it was confining the way it was, and uh, and I had uh, the Lake Isle of Industry, mm. and that's all for a half an hour. I said the poem, and then I just said the rhymes. And then I was saying every other line and I was not going to do it backwards. I had this poem, the, like the grid of it in my mind. And it, 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 it got me through that. Hmm. We're going to move to having a final poem from you, Billy. But I, I do want to say that there is a, a reminder throughout this whole new book and in so much of your work. And it's a lovely opportunity to say it to you while we're talking. Um, there is a reminder of the small things that contribute to what it means to be alive, to not be overly dramatic with oneself or to even take oneself too seriously, but to find a way where um, looking at what is pleasant and pleasurable too is a very serious fact of life. And it's a, I know that there are so many people in the room here who are so um, enlivened by the way that you remind us of the small things of life and do it with such whimsy and such insistence throughout so much of your career. So thank you very much. I've done a lot for my self-esteem today. But... <laughs> my pleasure. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a lovely thing to talk to you, Billy Collins, and over to you as you finish with a final poem before handing well, back I, I to chose this before Afton. you said those wonderful things, but it, it does kind of uh, exemplify them, I think. It's called, it's called Aimless Love. And it's, if it were an essay, it would be a kind of comparison and contrast essay. <clears throat> Aimless love. This morning, I walked along the lake shore. This morning, as I walked along the lake shore, I fell in love with a wren 
and later in the day with a mouse the cat had dropped under the dining room table. In the shadows of an autumn evening, I fell for a seamstress still at her machine in the tailor's window and later for a bowl of broth, steam rising like smoke from a naval battle. This is the best kind of love, I thought, without recompense, without gifts or unkind words, without suspicion or silence on the telephone. The love of the chestnut, the jazz cap, one hand on the steering wheel. No lust, no slam of the door. The love of the miniature orange tree, the clean white shirt, the hot evening shower, that highway that cuts across Florida. No waiting, no huffiness or rancor, just a twinge every now and then for the wren <clears throat> who had built her nest on a low branch overhanging the water and for the dead mouse still dressed in its light brown suit. But my heart is always propped up in a field on its tripod ready for the next arrow. <clears throat> After I carried the mouse by the tail to a pile of leaves in the woods, I found myself standing at the bathroom sink, gazing down affectionately at the soap. So patient and soluble, so at home in its pale green soap dish, I could feel myself falling again as I felt its turning in my wet hands and caught the scent of lavender and stone. Beautiful. Billy Collins, thank you so much. Thank you, Patrick. Great to talk to you. Some somebody's muted. I think Adrian is still. I muted. am yeah. trying. I'm I'm so wrapped with the conversation. I've forgotten that I have a job to do here. <laughs> and um that was so well, beautiful. Lord. It was such a delight. Thank you, Billy, for the wonderful reading and for making us laugh. And Padraig, for your incredible questions, you're such a listener and it was just a beautiful conversation. Thank you both. And for everyone who's watching today, if you don't already have a copy of Whale Day or Billy's other collections, please go buy them right away. Thank you all for tuning in. And an extra thanks to the Winter Words super fans who have joined us for every single event this season. If any of you feel inspired by our events or our programs, please, please, please consider making a donation to help us reach our April matching challenge. You'll see a link in the chat. And when we disappear, which is gonna happen very, very soon, you'll see a slide with some details on upcoming April events. On April 21st, please join us for the Aspen Words Literary Prize Ceremony. And to close out National Poetry Month on April 29th, we're hosting a youth poetry slam featuring middle and high school poets from the Roaring Fork Valley in Colorado. Registration is free for both of these events, so check out the links. And again, thank you both so much. Thanks everyone and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Billy.